Good morning, all you beautiful people. As I uh, was reminded this morning, I'm not allowed to shake hands anymore. So I'm just going to wave in the crowd. Hello, morning, morning. <laughs> no, but it's good to see all of you here this morning. It's so good to see each and every one of you in church. It's a good place to be where God can really speak to us. Amen. I really believe God wants to speak to us. And if you watch the video clip just now, this is going to be our camp speaker. You know, God is speaking. Who does believe that God is still speaking? Okay, two, three, four, five. <laughs> now, God is still speaking. And God wants to speak in especially a time as this. Especially with what's happening in Malaysia right now. The way that a lot of Malaysians feel, God wants to speak. Amen. And God wants to use you and me, each and every one of us, to bring a change. Amen. Maybe not to become a politician, but to pray for our country. Amen. And God is speaking. So you need to sign up for camp because I believe God really wants to speak to us. And no better time than to come together to set time aside to really see God. Amen. So please sign up for camp as soon as possible. God is going to speak and you don't want to miss it. Amen. Really, you don't want to miss it. Amen. Okay, this morning, I'm going to start a new series called Behind Closed Doors. Behind Closed Doors. It's a new series I'm going to start preaching about. And the whole thing is, it has been brewing in me for a little while already. In fact, before I started to preach the other uh, series that I did, this was already on my heart, but it was just not quite ready to release it. And you know what? With what happened in the last few weeks or, uh, yeah, a few weeks in the country, I feel sometimes we feel like we are behind a closed door. A lot of Malaysians, as I talk to them, have lost their hope in democracy, have lost their trust in this country. But you know what? God is still in control. Amen? God is still in control. If you don't believe it, confess it. Fake it until you feel it. Yes, very often that is reality of Christian life. Sometimes we don't feel like it, but we proclaim the truth and then our feelings will follow. Amen? Because I still know that God is in control. No matter what happens in our time right now, we know that God still sits on the throne. Throughout history, there were so many things where people could have lost hope talking about world wars, talking about when uh, different regimes rose up, uh, where persecution started to happen in the church on a scale that was never seen before. All these things people could have said, you know what, hope is lost. But after all, God was always and is still in control. Amen. But sometimes the reality is we live in a situation, we live in a circumstance or in a time where it feels like the door has been closed on me. When we're talking about closed doors, very often it refers to an opportunity that we thought was God-given. But all of a sudden it's taken away from us. Something that we thought would happen. We had dreams about it. We already imagined how it's going to be. All of a sudden something changes and the door is closed. It means the situation has changed. The opportunity is no longer there. Or it seems like something has shifted and it's not going to happen the way that we wanted it to be. But you know what? When I go through the Bible, very often when there is a phrase, the gate was shut, or behind closed doors, or the doors were closed, it is the very opportunity that God uses to really show His power. When there is an opportunity that seems to be taken away, a situation that seems tough, a situation that seems unfair. A situation that seems like, God, how can this be? Those are the situations that God can use to show His power. To show that He is still in control. Even though the door might be locked. Even though the door might be shut. The door might be closed. But God is still in control. And He can use exactly those kind of situations to show that He is powerful. So today we're going to talk about the power of faith. The, the power of faith. Faith that can change situation. Faith that can bring a change to the entire situation in a way that we could not produce it out of our own. And we're going to go into the scripture in Joshua chapter 2. 
Joshua chapter 2, 1 through 24. It's a long scripture. We're going to read it really quickly. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Joshua chapter 2. If you have your gadgets, bring it out. If not, it's going to be up there on the screen. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Akavia Cove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men sent out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come out tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent out orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. So they left at dusk and the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch them. Uh, but actually, she had hidden them up on the roof uh, beneath a bundle of flags she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies all along the road leading up to the shallow crossing of the Jordan River. As soon as the king's men had left, the gates of Jericho was shut. This is where the title comes from. The gates of Jericho was shut. Verse 8. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord has made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know how you did uh, to see on Og the Amorite kings to the east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight, against, uh, fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live, along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the man agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Verse 15. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape from the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days uh, from the man searching for you. Then, when they have returned, you go to on your way. Before they left, she told, uh, before they left, the man told her, We will be bound by the oath that we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into your land, you must leave this scarlet robe hanging from the window through which you have let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out into the streets and are killed, they, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on the people inside this house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet robe hanging from the window. The spies went into the hill country, stayed there for three days. The men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but they finally returned without success. Then the two spies came down from the hill country, crossed the Jordan River, and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. The Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Wow, that's a long scripture, isn't it? But you know what? There's so much inside here that can really change our life. Like I said, very often we feel in a situation where we feel the door is closed. Like the spies went into Jericho, spying out the land. All of a sudden the king hears, the spies are there, the soldiers are searching for them. And then the, the doors of the, 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 the gates of the city are shut. 
So they're locked in and they have no way of escape. They have no allies there. They have no one they can trust. They have nowhere to run. They have nowhere to escape. It seems like a bad situation. But then they went to see a prostitute. So by the way, right to get that out of the way, huh? God uses a lying prostitute to fulfill his purpose. Wow. Got really quiet here now. Let that one take hold of all those who have a holier-than-thou attitude. God used a lying prostitute to fulfill his purpose. Now that is supposed to be encouraging you. Because if God can use a lying prostitute, surely, Sam, he can use you. If God can use a person like that who did not even repent, it's not that she used to be like that, and then she started to change, and she was all holy, all nice, and she just waited for an opportunity for God to show up. No! God used her right there where she was. So that means God can use you. God can use me to accomplish His purpose that He has set for our lives. Amen! Come on, that should be encouraging to us. They say, you know what? Because very often I hear, Pastor, if you would know what's going on inside of me, I don't know if you would believe that God can use me. Well, look in the Bible. Right there. God used a person like that to accomplish His will. Surely He can use you. So turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. No matter in what situation you are, see, that leads us to the conclusion, it's going to be up there, that the prerequisite for God moving in our life is not perfection. It's not. But that is very often what we think. We think we have to be almost perfect. We have to have our life in order. We have to be just how everybody imagined a good Christian should be before God can really use us. But this conclusion comes out of the scripture that God is not looking for perfection in order to move in your life. What he is looking for is faith. Faith that God can use you regardless of the circumstances that you are in right now. The very situation that seems so hard, the very situation that seems so chaotic, the very situation that brings you to the point where you say, should I even go to church? I feel like a hypocrite if I stand there lifting my hands in worship. Exactly that situation that brought you to that point is what God can use. Exactly that situation God wants to step in and say, I don't require perfection in your life. All I require is that you have faith that I can do something. And then God will come in and change the whole situation. The good thing is, I'm going to jump ahead in my, in, my, in my sermon here towards the end. God used her in a mighty way. He did not only spare her, but he made her part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Think about that. He did not only spare her life, but he made her a part of the very work of salvation that would be for all of us. That is the kind of God that we worship. So never disqualify yourself. Never come to the place and say, you know what, because of what happened, God cannot do anything. I used to believe that, but now after my divorce, I don't know if God can do something. Or oh, I believe God could do something, but then my marriage is not so good anymore. Or my business failed. Or you don't know what happened in, in my life. Don't disqualify yourself, because God has a plan and a purpose for you. Amen? He wants to use you. He wants to use you even though we don't really see it ourselves. God wants to do something in your life. Amen? Just yesterday and uh, the, over the weekend we had cell groups and we came together and it was so nice to see just the different families who came just open up and share real life. Not come together and all just pretending everything is good, everything is nice, but they shared from their heart what is going on. They open up. And even though you are vulnerable in that state, that is what cell group, that is what church is all about. That we can be honest with one another, that we can carry each other, that we can encourage one another. That we don't have to pretend that everything is fine, but that we know that we can rely on people to build us up. 
So that when we are not strong enough to walk ourselves, that we can lean on somebody else. And we can lean on God, but we have to have the power of faith in our life. If we believe, God can really, really do something in our life. So what can we learn from Rahab? The first thing is, she decided to believe. Verse 9 and 11. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is living in terror. Jump down right to the ver uh, end of verse 11. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. She is not a believer. She was not a Jew, but she came to the conclusion. What God had done in your life must be a sign that he is the supreme God. And keep in mind what she is talking about happened 40 years earlier. Remember when Moses came and they, they sent spies into the land and they came back. Only two said, yes, we can take the land. Ten said, no, there are giants in the land. We are like grasshoppers. What they were actually was thinking, they were afraid of the Israelites. And for 40 years after that, while the Israelites were walking around in the desert, they were still talking about how God was working and fighting on their behalf. Israel was not aware of it. But the enemy was afraid because God was moving on their behalf. So they were unaware of God working in their life. And I wonder how many of us here this morning are unaware that God is actually working in the background. That we are in a situation where it seems chaotic. But God is still at the, at the, at the back scene, behind the curtain. And he's still in control. Very often we don't see it. But we know, we have the assurance that God is still there. That God is working. So she came to the point where she said, you know what? I believe that God is the supreme one. He is the God of the heavens and of the earth below. So she came to the conclusion, yes, it is true. God is true. But you know what? Only her thoughts, her conviction was not good enough. She had to take action. She had to do something with it. So when the spies came, she saw an opportunity. She knew that God was fighting on their behalf. They were talking about it for 40 years. So she, knows, she knew that the land would be taken. So when the opportunity presented itself, she took action. And she said, you know what? You have to show me kindness because I'm going to help you. So she struck a deal. She took action. It was not enough for her to believe that God could do something. She had to become active. She had to see the opportunity for the opportunity that it really was. That she could say, you know what? I'm going to help you, but I'm going to expect you to help me in return. I'm going to save you now from the soldiers. But when you come and take the land, I expect you to spare me and my entire family. Come on. She was a smart woman. And she struck the deal right there. But she had to take action. You know what? I talked to a person not too long ago and we were talking about Netflix. <clears throat> and then we were talking about the, And then all of a sudden the person said, you know what? I could have come up with that idea. Streaming movies and TV shows. I could have come up with that idea. Yes, coming up with an idea is one thing. But putting it into practice is a totally different thing. There were so many other platforms out there before Netflix. But they all didn't work. Not quite successful. They came along and they did it and they succeeded. See, having an idea is one thing. Having a conviction is one thing. But actually doing something about it is something totally different. It takes effort. It takes something out of us to make sure that we come out of the situation that we're in, that we can see the hand of God moving. It's not only enough knowing that God is in control over Malaysia. We have to do something about it. What can we do right now? We can pray. Come on. We can pray. We can bring it before God and say, God, I don't know what's happening, but I know that you're in control. Do something in this country. And your, pay, your prayers are powerful. We need to take action. We need to believe that God is in control, but we have to do something about it. Not just keep quiet about it. Not just saying, okay, I'm going to see what's going to happen. No, God has a plan and a purpose for you, for this country. But we have to do something about it. Amen? Just like Rahab took the opportunity and said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to strike a deal right here, right now. And that brought her the salvation that she was looking for. 
but she decided to believe and become active. The second thing that we can learn from her is that she put her trust in the promise. She put her trust in the promise. Verse 15, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the man agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. See, she had to put her trust in the promise. Now see, when the spies were still there, she had leverage. Because at any time she could have given up the spies knowing that they would be killed. So she had leverage. But once she let them go, there was no more leverage. She had to trust the promise, the word that these guys gave her. Now if I would have been in her situation, I would like to think I would have said, okay, you know what? I will let one of you guys go. The other one stays with me. So that when you guys come and take the land, I still have one in my basement, locked up as leverage. So if anything happens to me, that guy will also die. Some kind of leverage, yeah? But she didn't do that. She let them go and trusted the promise that these men gave to her. No more leverage. She just gave them a good sign of trust. I am going to trust that what these men said is going to come true without any leverage. You know what? We have to believe the promises that God has given on our life, even though it doesn't seem to be anything that we see in our lives right now. That God has a good plan for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, a good future. That God will provide your every need by His riches. That God is a good God who gives us peace. If we come to Him, that He will draw near to us all these things promises that we can find in the Bible, we have to put our trust in them. And I say, God, even though I don't see it right now, I know that they are true because they are in the Bible and that is your word and your word will always be true. Come on, put your trust in his promise, not in what you see right now. See, the thing is here, the fact is that I'm standing here preaching to you. Another fact is that you are sitting there looking at me. Most of you. Some looking at the phone, but most of you. See, now that I believe that you are actually listening to me, now that is faith. I don't know if you really listen to me. You could be looking at me thinking like, okay, I had char kway this morning for breakfast. Uh, lunchtime is almost here. I mean, the preacher better hurry up. What I'm going to eat for lunch later on. I don't know what's going on, but I just decide to believe that you listen to me. Ignorance can be so nice sometimes, right? I just believe that you listen to me. That why I take by faith. Even though I don't know if it's true or not, I believe it. You know what? Life is full of taking it by faith. Come on, if you're sick, what do you do? You go and see a doctor. Unless you go to Dr. Chin or a Dana doctor, you know. You go to a doctor that you had not really met before or don't really know. And then the doctor will check you out. Then he will prescribe medicine for you, right? And even if you see the medicine, you won't even know what the medicine really does, right? I mean, not many of you are pharmacists, so you probably don't know what the medicine will do for you. But you still take the medicine home and you still take it as the doctor prescribed. Not really knowing what you put inside your body, but you trust and believe that it will be for the better. That you will feel better afterwards. That is living by faith. Even though you don't know exactly what's going to happen, even though you don't exactly know what this is, you still take it in faith because the doctor said it's good for you. Come on. So if God says, you know what, I am in control, I believe in you, I will provide for you, Take it by faith. Even though right now you might not see it in your life, believe the promise. Come on. Now I know, pastor, it's easier said than then. Yes, I know. But it's the truth nonetheless. And we have to hear the truth so that we can remind ourselves to trust in God's promise. You might come to a point where you say, I don't even know if I believe that God can do something anymore. Trust in the promise. I don't know if God can really use me. Trust in the promise. God, you don't know what happened. 
No, God knows. Pastor, you don't know what happened. Trust in the promise. Just as she had to trust in the promise that was given, we have to trust what God has pronounced over our life. Amen? The third thing we can learn from her is, is that she persevered. Verse 21 and 22. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them on their way. Leaving the scarlet robe hanging from the window, the spies went up into the hill country and stayed there for three days. Now, I want to show you something. This one really blew my mind. I did some research. Yes, I did some research. So, by the way, you know what? If you Google, be careful what you Google. Because I started Googling Rahab prostitute. And the results that come out, if you Google prostitute, you have to be very careful. Just a sign on. Uh, here. So, you know what? You, maybe some of you are familiar with the term red light district, right? So I started to uh, look the background about how this came about. And many believe it was because of the rail workers who had red lantern. When they went to see prostitutes, they would leave it outside. But then I found out that it actually dates back even further than that into Bible times and even before that. So what would happen is that the prostitute, when she would be opening her business for business that night, she would go to the door and rang, uh, hang a red scarlet a rope out on her door so that the people, the men who were seeking her kind of services would know she is open for business. So there would be a red cloth hanging at the door so that the, the man would know, okay, this is where I can get lucky. So, but see here, when she struck the deal, the deal all of a sudden was, you have to hang the scarlet that was there usually in the door, and you have to hang it outside of your window. Right? And even when the, when the spice left, we just read that it was said that she has to leave the cloth hanging out because that is the sign that they are still bound by the contract that they made with her. So if there is no scarlet hanging out of the window, means they are not bound to keep their promise, to keep her and her family safe. Only when they see the rope hanging out of the window, that is the sign that she will be spared. See, now the man left and she had to leave the rope hanging out of the window, which now means that she could not put it on the door. But if she didn't put it on the door, she would have no business. You see? So now God basically forced her to abandon what she was doing before. As a sign of the contract with the spies, she had to leave the rope hanging outside the window, which means she could not go back to what she was doing before. She had to change her life. She had to put her trust not only in the promise that she would be spared, but she had to change her life right here, right now. Not going back to what she was doing before. She had to just trust that what God was speaking through the spies would be true. And she could not go back anymore. Now I did some more research. I read the Bible and I put all the things together. So how long did she have to wait? Well, the spies were hiding first for three days in the countryside. And then they took the journey back to the, Jeri uh, to the Jordan River. From Jericho to the Jordan River is about 70 plus kilometers, which would take about three days journey for them because it's a, it's a hilly country and it's not a straight road. So that would be another three days. That's six days already. Then when they came there, Joshua decided to wait for three days on God to speak to them after hearing the news. It's all in the Bible. So they waited another three days in the camp. Then Joshua said, okay, now it's time to go. So they had to go back, cross the Jordan River, walk all the way to Jericho. It's another three days. And then Joshua said, you know what? Before we left Egypt, all the men were circumcised, but the generation growing up in the desert was not circumcised. As a sign that we are still having a covenant with God, we're going to circumcise all the men. And I did some research about that as well. It takes about 7 to 10 days to recover from a circumcision, depending how old and how healthy you are. So they had to wait another 10 days. And then only they came to Jericho. And then God told them, okay, once every day you walk around the city, 
On the seventh day for six days. On the seventh day, you walk around seven times and the walls will crumble down. So how long did she have to wait? At least 29 days. Come on. We read it in the Bible as if they just left, they came back and everything happened so fast. But she had to wait for 29 days, at least, probably even more, before she saw the promise fulfilled. See, this is the difficult part, the waiting. Not only waiting, but I, the, the lady couldn't even go back to her former profession. She couldn't even do what she used to do. She had to change. She had to persevere. She had to wait and trust in God's promise. And she had nothing to go on to say, it's really going to happen. She just had to believe. And that is the power of faith. That is the power of faith, to believe that God can do something, even though you are just waiting. That is the hardest part, isn't it? Waiting. Not being able to do anything. Just waiting for God to do something. You know what, like this uh, last week, it happens quite often. In the morning, we are always rushing, trying to get out of the house and everyone is busy doing a thing. And then we have Tiana. And you know what? She is very different from the rest of us. We are all busy rushing here, rushing there, trying to get out of the house. And there she is slowly walking to the kitchen. I say, Tiana, hurry up. We are rushing. Okay, Papa. Slowly going, taking her Cocoa Crunch, putting her milk. Then slowly going to the table, putting it down. I said, Tiana, we have to rush. You still have to comb your hair. You still have to pack your bag. And we have to get out of the house. Okay, Papa. Slowly eating her thing. And, and I'm there. It's like, oh, my goodness. Cannot tahan. It's like, oh, my goodness. Okay, I go out of the house. At least I don't have to look at her. Taking her own sweet time. So I'm waiting in the car. Like, waiting, waiting. Oh, my goodness. She is not coming out. We have to leave. See, the thing is also, my justification is if we leave 10 minutes later in the house, it will take me more than half an hour on the road longer than what it takes already because traffic is building up. And I'm not patient, so I don't like traffic. So we have to leave the house at a certain time. And I'm there and I just have to wait. And that is the most difficult. Just waiting. Just waiting, not being able to do anything. I'm, you know, when she grows older and we have an appointment, she is too late, I will just leave her home. It happened once with my brother. Me, my two brothers, we were all getting ready. Last, the second brother, he was late. And he was very lax with time. I guess he's not really German after all. But you know what? So my brother said, you know what? We are late already. We're just going to leave. So we left him behind. We went to the party with our friends. And he was, le <laughs> he was left at home. But you know what? From then onwards, he was on time. But you know what? Sometimes we are in a, in a, in a situation where we have to wait. Waiting is the hardest part because we believe God, we trust Him, but we have to persevere. We just have to wait for God to do something. But the good thing here is, is that a very sign that was her guilt, that was her sin, that was her former lifestyle would become the sign of her salvation. That that what she was struggling with before, that was brought shame on her, that was the situation before, would become the very sign of her salvation. That God was still using her. That star God still had a plan. He still had a purpose for this woman. And that brings really comfort to my heart. And I hope it brings comfort to your heart this morning. That God can use us, but we have to persevere. But that is the power of faith. To just hang in there. To just believe that God can do something regardless. No matter what happened in the past, very often the one thing that you really struggled with, uh, struggled with can become the created asset that God has in your life. We've heard it so many times. People who have struggled with uh, abuse when they were growing up. God used them in a way to bring a reconciliation to other people later on who are struggling with the same thing. People who went through difficult situations in their life are able to help others who are going through it because they have come through stronger. Drug addicts, so many stories I've heard where God came in, changed their life completely around and now they're helping others to get free as well. The, sh the thing that was shame, the sign, the thing that was the past, that they don't, uh, it's not nice to think about, but very often God can use exactly that for the greatest asset 
for the greatest ministry that you can be in. Amen? So never disqualify yourself. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I already said it. She didn't only have to persevere, but he had to change. Verse 6, uh, Joshua 6, 23, 25. The man who had been spiced, this is now when they came back and they took the land. The walls came tumbling down. The man who had been spiced went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the other relatives who were with her. They moved the whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. And of course we know, like I already mentioned before, she would become a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. From her, five generations later, King David was born. I mean, at that time, just David, but later he would become King David. 28 generations later, Jesus Christ was born. So between her and Jesus Christ, 33 generations. God made her a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He did not only spare her, but he made her a part of the plan of salvation. So regardless of her past, regardless of what was there before, regardless of the shame that she had on her life, God used her to accomplish His purpose in life. And that is the good news that we have for us, that no matter what happens in the past, no matter what the situation looks right now, God can use us. The plan and the purpose that He has for our life, He still wants to fulfill it. All that we have to have is the faith to believe that God can actually do it. Remember, the definition of faith is to complete confidence in something or someone. So put your confidence in God. If the situation that you're in doesn't give you confidence, believe in God. Put your trust in Him, His promise that He can still use you and still fulfill the plan and the destiny that He has for your life. Because that has never changed. The plan and the purpose, the prophetic calling that God has on your life is still there. Regardless of what might have happened in the past. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God wants to use us to bring a change where we are right now. Amen. Can the praise team come this morning please?